Thanks, everybody. Uh, welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri. Our next guests are the stars of one of the craziest movies of the year. To tell you anything about it would be giving away all the fun of watching it unfold. Suffice to say, it's about Nazis, it's produced by J.J. Abrams, and it's never what you think it's gonna be. Check out the trailer right now for Overlord. From Overlord, please welcome John Majera and Giovanna Depo. Let's hear it. Hi, hi. Uh, guys, congratulations on this fucking bananas movie. Um, I, you know, the trailer says a lot of what it is. As I just told you, I, I hadn't watched the trailer when I went to see it last week. And really, I don't want to give anything away because it's so much fun watching this movie take the turns and twists that it does because you never expect it. Okay, so we'll leave that. Yeah, Great. get out It was of good here. talking to you. Yeah, Just know perfect. that they're in it. It's a movie. It exists. Yeah, we should go, see, go it. see it. Uh, what did you think when you were reading the script for the first time? I thought it was insane. I mean, everything that you see on screen definitely translated on the script first. So... I knew that it was going to be a, a crazy ride, so I was excited to try to be a part of it. Yeah, I, I think you got you read the script before you were cast, right? Mm -hmm. So I didn't read, I didn't get the script until after I was cast. Um, I'm not just not as important as Jovan is, <laughs> but that's fine. I've accepted that. And uh, when I finally got it, after so I, I was sort of going into it with a trust in JJ and Julius's vi vision. And, uh, the writers, that which I knew were Billy Ray, fantastic writer, and Mark L. Smith, who wrote The Revenant. So you knew that there were good people involved. Billy Ray did, like, Captain Phillips, right? And Captain a number Phillips. of, a lot of stuff. Uh, Hunger Games, you know, he's... So, so there was a trust there, and I felt comfortable going along with it, and I had an idea of the character, but I didn't get it until after. So when I finally read it, I mean, I was totally <laughs> stunned. Uh, I had no idea where Tibbet was going, and I mean, I was just shocked. And and every and f when we saw it, it, we were shocked. It just became something even grander than what we ever could have expected. What was it like on set with all of these effects, all these makeup effects? How much of it was practical? How much of it was CG? I think they had, they had a pretty good balance. I want to say majority of all the pieces were practical, practical. right? Well, I was I, I think it was pretty amazing how much practical elements there were in a, in the world we live in nowadays. That's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, you know, entire scenes are shot with a green screen and then they develop a world around you. This we had an actual fuselage for the plane. We had an actual town that they built on a back lot. Mm -hmm. We had the most of our uh, uh, our, I don't even know what to call them. They're, they're super soldiers, we'll, we'll yeah. refer to them as, are in practical Performers. makeup and latex. And it, I mean, it was insane. Yeah. Uh, so you guys get on set, you're, you're, you're doing this movie, and uh, it's kind of about World War II soldiers, but also kind of not. You can take a lot of liberties. How much research do you want to do when it comes into playing a soldier, or do you kind of leave that up to the, the, the script since it's doing something a little bit different? I think we did just about enough as I guess what we covered during boot camp, like with the uh, the weapons training and just being familiar with uh, with the uh, I guess the procedures that soldiers would follow while they were away at war. But as far as what we were actually going through in the script, we didn't do too much because we knew that we'd be you know drifting from it quite a bit once it was. Yeah, I mean we knew that this sort of was operating on a parallel universe of World War II. It isn't. Obviously, it is in World War II. Uh, there were things like this happening, but not the way it is presented in this film. Um, so, so we did want to have a base of the soldiers. We wanted to pay respect to, to the greatest generation of soldiers who served Absolutely. at that time. But uh, we also wanted to acknowledge that this wasn't Saving Private Ryan by any means. Um, I personally, and I think Wyatt also said this, you know, I watch things like the, the documentary Five Came Home, you know, like those with those John Ford films, yeah. things like that, the old war propaganda that we were issuing in newsreels at the time. And I thought that was very helpful because I, I, I think there's a kind of element of this movie, you said Grindhouse or like B-movie, or, or, or which is in the vein of those newsreels, I, I think, that, that lent itself to the research of our film. Oh, that's interesting. You're saying like the, the, the sort of grindhouse take on World War II, which there was a vast sort of canon of in like the 60s and 70s, so like She-Wolf of the SS and all of these movies about sort of villainous, crazy Nazis um, sort of lent, them, lent themselves to the newsreel footage that you were watching or that came from like Five, five Came Home? 
I think that those kind of films and ours were inspired by that sort of picture that was painted of World War II. You know, it wasn't like, like I said, the Saving Private Ryan picture of World War II. It was this this, this sort of campy version of it. Um, not that our film is camp. I think it transcends it. Like, it takes those sort of very genre cop films and elevates it to an A a level film by having the people like J.J. Abrams and uh, writers and uh, fantastic actors and a budget from Paramount to execute it in, in a, a higher higher way. Yeah, I would say one of the amazing things about Overlord is as much as it, I think, um, operates within a world that would normally be camp, it's not a campy movie in any way. It never is winking or poking fun at itself. It's just sort of is what it is. Uh, Giovanni said that he, you were uh, cast prior to him before really seeing the script, or you had seen the script before you were cast? I had seen the script, yes. Uh, what was the casting process like for you? Um, it's the traditional way. You know, I, I had, I want to say I auditioned three times. The first time I had already read majority of the first, you know, the earlier draft of the script, and then I had two auditions with Julius, the third one being like a camera test. And, you know, when they do the camera test, they'll have like a like an actor who's not going for any of the other parts, but they're there to assist you with your with your process. So after the third audition, I knew I waited maybe a month or so before I found out I got the job. And I found out the same day that Wyatt found out that he had gotten the job as well. Wyatt Russell, who's mm -hmm. also in the film. What was it like working with uh, Julius Avery? This is kind of his first big, sort of big budget studio movie, right? He's yeah. a, an Australian director, if I, if I could, am I right there? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. He, his first film, what was it, Son of a Gun, was his first film, which was like a big heist movie because he loves heist movies. But as far as this being his first big budget film, I think he handled it brilliantly. You know, when, it, when I mean, it comes they, to... They're still working together on another thing. So absolutely. Their, their relationship, he, uh, JJ had a lot of trust in him. And and Julius rose to the challenge with ease. So yeah, ease. Yeah, which everybody can't ease. do because you know he has a he has a, he has a um, strong sense of what he wants, and he has a, a good confidence uh, about himself and his ability. And I think when you're taking on the responsibility of a enormous production like Overlord was, you, you kind of have to have that if you're going to guide the ship, especially when you have someone like J.J. Abrams watching over you. Uh, there's an incredible uh, sequence at the beginning of the film where uh, the plane gets shot up. We see it a little bit in the trailer, and your character is kind of parachuting. It's incredibly well done. I have no idea how they did this sequence. Can you talk about how you guys shot it? I guess without giving too much away. But so we had this rig. What, what model plane was that? It was like a C C forty. C20. I, mean, I could be totally wrong. It's been a while <laughs> right. since we shot it, so no one freak out. But I want to say like a C24. Yeah, so, so we had a rig created, uh, and we were at the uh, Leavesden Studios in, in, um, in Watford, England, I think. And, uh, we were in Leavesden. We were in Le so we were in the Warner Brothers studio where they sh uh, shot right, like Harry right. Potter and all those kinds right. of things. And Fantastic Beast was down the street. She, you know, in the stage. Mission Impossible was next door. Yeah, so really? yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's like an, a very active studio, and we had our our stage where they built the fuselage. Built, yeah, built built the mock you know plane or whatever, and then we were all suspended because you had to take these three story steel stairs to the top of the uh, of the rig and would be strapped into the you know the uh, old school nineteen forties parachute guard, which is incredibly uncomfortable. I mean, it's like your yeah. chest is like latched onto your kneecaps. And you're just sitting, and it's a full group of guys. There had to be like 30 of us. Maybe more. And once you get up there, and once you're locked in, and they remove the steps, you know, so that the rig can stand alone by itself, you're up there. So we'd spend four hours at a time. <laughs> at a time, with like like we said before, practical effects, the flames and the sparks, and and the rig would actually, you know, had hydraulics over so tilt and bend whenever they needed it to, and it was. An intense shoot. We shot that one scene. That was like a week and a half. It felt like it was a it long was. time. It was, yeah. What about the shot where you're falling out of the sky, though? That's the one that I'm particularly referencing. Ah. It's like all one shot. So that was, I was suspended in the air with, uh, I hate to try to describe it. It'd be wrong. Like a visual effects guy would be like, no, we use this kind of rig. But I was suspended in the air, and I had like all these type of pulleys and things like that. And it was like this gyrating rig that was attached to my stomach. And they would just spin it in every which way. And I'd just be, and I'd be in the air, which I hated because I hate, you know, heights and roller coasters and all that. So that was like hell for me. But what were you like 10 feet, like up, 15 feet up? It was, high, it was higher than that. It was pretty, it was pretty high. 
I want to say between 30 and 50 feet, maybe. It would actually be kind of flipping you and spinning oh. you around? <laughs> all day. It's an all day long thing, just going for it. Just scream like you, like you hate it. Oh, this is coming quite natural. <laughs> <laughs> this is awful. How many but days did you have to did you? I did that. That was a pre-shoot. So I was doing that for two days before we actually started actual filming. Yeah, because I remember you coming back to the apartment after that and just being, looking like a zombie. Oh, being man. So miserable. We were all so enjoying it because we're, it was pre-production, so we really didn't have a lot to do, the rest of us. So we'd be having a lovely glass of wine, and Javon would come wandering back, and we're like, come join us. And he's like, no. no I'm going to bed. Did you guys all live together in an apartment before you started shooting or while you were yeah, shooting? Well, not, like, we had separate apartments, but it was sort of like a dorm. There were dorm. three of us in this uh, apartment building, and we were like one on top of another in different rooms, but it became just like one giant room, you know. The lady, the landlord, she hated John and Matilda. She did she, not she hate She loved but me. She hated she, you guys. She hated Till. I was a very good tenant. <laughs> Why? Because it's, she's it's French a, and she's and she's partier. she's young and she's partying and. And I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a respectable old man who, who wait, kept no, was, very normal it like hours. Vi- it was like vice versa. Usually the landlord hates the tenant because the tenant's partying and loud. You hated the landlord because she no, was No, no, I had no, no the, te- the landlord hated Till. Oh, sure. Till. She was oh. partying and loud. Gotcha. And, uh, and she loved me. She, was, she invited me back. She would send me emails about how I was her favorite because I was the most respectable. <laughs> so, I mean, take what you want from that. <laughs> and how did you guys uh, get along as like a group of guys while shooting? Like, did you try to forge like a friendship beforehand? Because I mean, really in the, the story is you guys are kind of all don't know each other that well. You're thrust into this scene really for, or this moment in time for the first time with each other. I think we all got along like really well right away, especially during like boot camp because we didn't have a choice but to like band together or else Freddie was going to kill us. <laughs> and with all the training that we were doing and the physical, you know, Freddie, the guy running boot camp? Freddie was our military advisor, and he's, he's a handful. He, you know, the man's the best, and he got it out of us for sure. Wait, that's so funny. I think I just had someone here yesterday from another movie who had Freddie, the military advisor. I believe advisor. it. Yeah. Freddie's he's, working. He's, he's, he's doing yeah, his he thing. He does a lot of it. But I, I think that boot camp forced, it almost forced you. It forces you when you're surrounded by people, you know, 24 hours a day for five days, and you don't know each other, and you're in these kind of difficult situations to, to, to just forge a relationship. I think that's why these like corporations do these team building exercises where you send someone out to the woods and you have to like fall and trust or whatever. But uh, this was like that on steroids because it was, it was really intense. But that relationship, uh, by doing that, it forged those relationships and it, and it started us on our rhythms of talking to each other and the way we joked and, and day one, it, it, it was there. It was there. You know, we said that there's a, a grindhouse element to this movie, and I even referenced that period of time where grindhouse was making kind of a lot of uh, uh, Nazi films. Uh, for lack of a better expression, they're not Nazi movies. They're just about Nazis. Uh, did you guys go back and watch any of those? Were there any talk of those movies on set at all? No, I, I think they were making it quite clear that they wanted us to do our own thing. And base I, everything in realism, right? Yeah, I think I think we avoided those films because we wanted to approach this as real people. In and I, I think there would be a worry about watching those because they tend to be overly campy, yeah. and 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 almost too silly. Um, so we want we, if anything, wanted to look at it as real people, real soldiers being thrown into an extraordinary circumstance, and and that's how we played it. That's how it was directed. Um, and I think that's the way. That's what it lives and dies on. That's what the way it works is by keeping it grounded in some semblance of reality that we can relate to. How long were you guys out on the shoot? It was like four months, I think. That's a long shoot. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, what was the hardest part about it? Probably your day in the air, getting flipped in the air around. and and doing the underwater stuff. Yeah. Like, Allergies. That, yeah. Oh, hay fever. Hay oh, fever. we both got hay fever really bad. <laughs> we what were the, is hay fever? I don't know. Hay fever. We call it just allergy, you know, allergies, okay, like yeah. pollen allergies. But us two were dying <laughs> in the field, like swelling up. Uh, we had to stay. They had to put us in a car. We were, we were way far away from our base camp, as they call it, like oh, where your trailers are and yeah. everything. So you couldn't go back. So we would sit in a car, and we were just dying. We were out there all night long. And then Ian who's Scottish, and one of our castmates, like a <laughs> hobbit, like laying in a field of ra- ragweed, being like, oh, I'm fine. And we're like, you asshole. 
And it was like, uh, it was bad because I was making fun of John first because we'd be in the middle of our takes and we'd be going through, like walking through and he'd just be like in the middle of his line. Yeah, I'll make sure that I buy the... <laughs> and I was laughing at him the whole time. And then like an hour later, my face blew up. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, uh, Hitch, when Will Smith's face blows up. Every <laughs> face literally looked like that. It was so bad. They had to send us home because he was the most we handsome gonna make he ever it. looked. By the way, it was <laughs> he's not lying. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, let's get some questions from our audience. Who has a, a question right here? Hi, um, I wanted to know uh, since you uh, since you guys had had this boot, boot camp, um, what was the most uh, um, memorable moment that, uh, that that you got out of the experience? <laughs> Why don't you take that? <laughs> out of the boot camp was okay. So we had this thing called Fire Watch. That's what you were thinking? Yeah, yeah. So fire watch is... Uh, there are several, but yeah. It was basically yeah. like, you know, security. So we, if we have a fire at the end of the night and it's time for everyone to go to bed, we have shifts of who's going to watch the fires just as an exercise to, you know, simulate what they had to do to make sure that everyone could sleep safely and soundly. So Freddie had a cell phone and he's like, you use this for time because we didn't have cell phones. He took all of our technology. And he was like, just hold on to this. This is how you keep track of time. Don't lose my phone. So everybody got through with their shifts having Freddie's phone except for Rosenfeld, who is Dominic Applewhite, the youngest of the bunch, and he's like our sweet baby He was still, I think he was still, he's like 21. Yeah, that he was just out of theater school. Like, and like, Really eager and green and, you know, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed kind yeah. of guy. And we gave him the last shift because that's the easiest one. That's the Yeah, last like you one. don't have to wake, so that way you can sleep on through, and then you're the last shift, and then we all wake up in the morning, and, and you, you can just stay awake. It's worse when you have to wake up in the middle of the night and then go back to sleep, you know? So... So Dominic comes into the tent and we have this huge tent that we're all sleeping in. We have our, you know, our cots or whatever. And he comes in and he's like nudging me and he's like, Javon. And naturally we ended up being really close because we're close in the film. We're like buddies. And he's like, Javon, um, it seems that I've, uh, I've lost, I've lost Freddie's phone. And I wake up and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? He's, I, I just can't, I lost his phone. And so I said, go tell Wyatt. Because Wyatt was like, he's the corporal of the group and he was kind of like leading the way and I was like you gotta tell Wyatt so Wyatt he woke him up and he's like yo I think I've, I've lost Freddie's phone and Wyatt's like what well you gotta fucking find it <laughs> <laughs> and Dominic just starts waking everybody up he wakes John up John's like what are you doing John's grumpy as get away from me <laughs> Go to, what are you doing I'm trying to sleep we'll find it you better find it or Freddie's gonna so it was like a big thing and we had to like we all crept out and like we're just walking around the fire which is like dying down at this point and looking for uh, like an Hands old Motorola phone. Did you find it? We did, but it was like in his pocket. I went back it? to bed. I did, how'd you guys, I don't know how you guys found it. It was like in his pocket. Like it's on something. you. It was oh yeah, right. Something it was like, silly. I think it was like, sitting on his bed, but it was so dark. We had no light in the, we were in like a proper tent from, you know, the 1940s and there were no lights. The only light was from the cell phone. So you're just, you know, like a thing would be right in front and you had no clue that it was there. It was just, Yeah. Yeah, that was tough. The, the most memorable. Uh, next question. So we have an online question. Someone wants to know: Was there one standout funniest moment from set? Apparently not. Like none that I could share. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, God, what? Dominic, like, making fun of everybody? Like, I he think, does really good impressions? I think, well, that was funny. Dominic would imp impersonate our, our crew members and stuff like that. But I also thought it was funny. You and him were both pretty gullible. And Tilda and I would, like, p play tricks on you. Like, one time, <laughs> Tilda's the, she was Mathilde Olivier. She's the only female, basically, in this whole movie. Who, and she's, like, the toughest of all of us by, by uh, you know, miles. And, um... <laughs> And like she started doing this thing where to Dominic because he was so like sweet and stuff where she would sort she's like French and very cute and and she would like sort of like give him the eye a little bit and then he would get all uncomfortable and then <laughs> and then we started doing it to Joe we then we were like we we're like I think she likes you I think she likes you and we're like right Joan and, and Joan's like yeah I think he had no idea what we were talking about but then we kept it going and he kept he kept uh, agreeing with us and then made it Dominic very uncomfortable. We, because he had a girlfriend and he, and he didn't want to hurt her feelings. He was away at theater school and he's like, oh, this is so bad. I have to tell her. I'm like, yeah, we're like, he didn't do anything. What are you talking about? Dominic, he's so tender. He's a tender little, little snowflake. 
Um, guys, congratulations on the movie. It's crazy. It's so much fun. Uh, it's going to be massive. I love the film. Thank congratulations. You. Thank you so much. It opens um, November 9th, right? Everybody could go see it. And I uh, give a big round of applause for Jovan and John. Let's hear it. Thank you.